Ukraine on air. We welcome you from the heart of the Europe and we continue delivering you the latest updates from the uh, Russian war in Ukraine here in studio today, Nick Starkov. Good evening. And we go forward with the traditional news. Uh, we uh, talk about uh, every broadcast we talk about the opponents losses in Ukraine, the losses of Russian Federation. Uh, you will see now uh, on the screen uh, the graphic where you see the death range the death range now exceeds uh, 17,700. This is just a, um, just a very very narrow account uh, of uh, losses. You will see uh, you see the tanks range. Over the past 24 hours Russian forces lost 11 tanks, 16 combat armored vehicles, 5 artillery systems, uh, the number of mu multiple rocket launchers stays the same as yesterday, 96. 54 anti-aircraft missile launchers and uh, also over the past uh, day, uh, Russian forces lost 8 military planes. You'll see other numbers, figures indicating losses of automobile vehicles, ships, fuel tanks, unmanned aerial vehicles and uh, other special equipment. Now we go forward with the first story prepared for you by my colleague about the Russian losses in Ukraine. They do not know where their men are going to. They, nobody tells them where uh, they disappear. Uh, they come back either in coffin or as the captured. And those who were able to get in touch in return are accused of political illiteracy. Weak compensation for loss limp. My colleague Evgeny Michin knows more about the attitude towards Russian military in Russia. Hello. They call their relatives in Russia. They tell how the whole battalions are destroyed. They say that they kill civilians. They say that it's not their war. But what do they hear in response? You're all so politically unprepared there, and I really want to come and beat this out of you. This is only one of the calls of Russian occupiers to their parents intercepted by the security service of Ukraine. The overall belief among Russians in Russia, their army attacked Ukraine not to be attacked by Ukraine. The same higher purpose was declared by Belarusian so-called president. So they really believed that the country of this side was going to invade these two countries. But the Russia didn't just lead them into attack, the Russia didn't allow them to get out of the combat. We wanted to turn away and leave because we didn't need this war, but the brigade commander told us that our own soldiers will execute us. This is one of the many similar statements of the captured Russians. They die in Ukraine by the thousands. Their country doesn't even want to get back the bodies, as usual, pretending they didn't exist. 17,300 Russian soldiers are killed due to the Ukrainian armed force data. The Russians' numbers are more than 10 times under. The BBC reports that so-called Cargo 200 went from Ukraine to 70 from 80 regions of Russia. Many of them died on the drills or under unknown circumstances, and here is why. Families of the soldiers who were killed during the special military operation in Ukraine will receive the insurance compensation of 7,431,000 rubles. This is Putin's statement from the 3rd of March. For that day it was about $67,000, now it's less. And considering the 17,300 Russian troops died in Ukraine, it's going to be around $1,100,000,000 for the country where they fight for sugar and demand McDonald's to come back. There are absolutely no mentions of the families who received this money. Which is weird for the country that film fakes every day. There are also another insurance payment, 3 million rubles for every wounded soldier, about $27,000. For example, these soldiers would apply for this compensation. For them, special military operation was sort of surgery. Somebody left one-handed, another one-legged. But instead of money, they receive diplomas and medals and inspiring words of commander. I reward you, congratulations. I wish you to get well, get back on your feet. 
Yes, correct. The commander wishes one legged soldier to get back on his feet. Due to official Russian data, there are almost 4,000 wounded troops. Armed forces of Ukraine have counted at least 10 times more. Russian Federation is relocating its units in Belarus. Uh, the Journal Staff of Ukraine reported that yesterday occupiers deployed new missiles in Gomel, in uh, Belarus. Uh, also, there are uh, newcomers 200 mercenaries, three Iskander type missile systems, and uh, two S 300 anti aircraft defense systems. Uh, more on this uh, relocation and reshuffling and still. Uh, more threat, deploying more threats towards Ukraine, you'll see in the next story. Shelling, damaging and killing of civilians, the Kremlin occupiers continue to attack Severodonetsk, Lysychansk and Rubizhne. They damaged 20 objects. This includes nine multi-story buildings, nine private houses and infrastructure facilities. As a result of the attack in Severodonetsk, two people died and many wounded. Severodonetsk and Rubizhne in Luhansk region are left completely without water and cities of Lysychansk and Hirske partially. 32 settlements remained without gas and 12 are off electricity. The occupiers are trying to toss all their forces into the Donetsk and Luhansk regions and fully occupy these areas. They don't need people, they don't need new, modern swimming pools, our sports fields, they don't need anything. The Russians need to check the box that they got the territory. Nothing more, check the box. They don't care about children, about the elderly and about women. They don't care about hospitals, maternity houses. They don't care about anyone. That's why, unfortunately, there will be probably more shelling. In the Donetsk direction, Russian army is getting reinforced with soldiers relocated from the military base in Abkhazia. The siege of Mariupol continues. British intelligence considers Mariupol to be the main target of the occupying forces, but Ukraine still controls the center of the city. Fighting also continues in the Kharkiv region. The occupiers launched a missile attack nearby the city center of Kharkiv and also shelled several districts of the city. But Ukrainian defenders successfully repelled the attacks of the enemy. They destroyed four aircraft, one fighter and three bombers. Combat for resume continues. The Ukrainian armed forces hold their positions in this direction. Rescuers continue to remove the debris at the site of a missile hit in Mykolaiv Regional Administration. As for 1 p.m. Kyiv time, Regional Mykolaiv Emergency Service Department confirms 28 deaths. Rescuers found the bodies of 26 victims and one person died in hospital. Combat is ongoing in Hostomol for more than a month. The partial withdrawal of Russian troops from the north of the Kyiv region towards Belarus is continuing. Ukraine is conducting successful counterattacks around Kyiv. This is reported by British intelligence. Also, according to their data, Ukrainian forces have recaptured the villages of Sloboda and Lukashivka to the south of Chernihiv and now are positioned along one of the main supply routes between Chernihiv and Kyiv. Russian troops have almost withdrawn from the Brovary district. The Ukrainian armed forces now will clean up the settlements from occupiers, enemy equipment and conduct mine clearance. Ukrainian military liberated 11 settlements from Russian invaders in the Kherson region. Locals greeted Ukrainian servicemen, thanking them and treating them with food. We've been waiting for you. Take it, please. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back later. A little bit later. Fire incident happened in uh, Russian city Belgorod. On the, uh, uh, you, uh, the uh, Ru Russian uh, uh, newsmakers uh, accused the Ukrainian military in an alleged air attack on the oil depot in the Russian city Belgorod. Uh, at the same time, uh, Ukrainian Defense Ministry officially has officially overturned this information. Uh, and also, uh, Mikhailo Podolyak, an advisor to the head of the presidential office, stated that such statements do not contribute 
to the constructive atmosphere during the negotiations between Ukrainian and Russian sides. And um, now here in our studio, uh, we are welcoming our first distinguished guest. Uh, this is uh, Ambassador John Herbst, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center and former U.S. United States Ambassador to Ukraine. Uh, Mr. John, I greet you in, here in our studio. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, my first question to you, we know that the European Union is now uh, plans to, um, to increase the pressure on Russia. A number of other banks and family members and oligarchs are in line to be banned, their, uh, their uh, assets will be frozen, probably they will be banned from entering European Union. We know how it works already. But at the same time, my question for, to you is the effectiveness of such sanctions towards Russia in, in view of uh, actions of Russian Federation. I think the sanctions are a very good thing to put pressure on the Russian economy, which will in turn over time weaken the Russian military, and also to put pressure on people who benefit from Moscow's um, authoritarian and corrupt regime. Having said that, to give Ukraine more immediate help on the battlefield, the United States and our NATO partners should be sending Ukraine more weapons and more advanced weapons. The, uh, we know that uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, officials, uh, President of Ukraine announced uh, the uh, organization of a new body of international experts and Ukrainian experts that should check out the effectiveness of sanctions. Uh, maybe you, uh, you could somehow um, give some uh, light on the, um, on the procedures. How, how does experts will check uh, the sanctions effectiveness? How will they? Well, um, there, there are experts in Ukraine who follow sanctions. There are experts in the United States and, in Europe, uh, and elsewhere in Europe who follow sanctions. <clears throat> and I think their work provides a valuable contribution for the decision makers in Washington, in Brussels, in other European capitals, as they decide what additional sanctions to um, impose on Moscow. Um, right now, I uh, propose, uh, propose our audience and you uh, to take a look at the uh, latest uh, uh, address of the uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, one of the latest, uh, which he uh, delivered in the Parliament of Australia. Let's take a look. New sanctions against Russia are needed. Strong sanctions. As long as it doesn't abandon nuclear blackmail, the blockade of the sea it must pay the highest price. No Russian ship should be allowed into the ports of the free world. Buying Russian oil means paying for the destruction of the foundations of global security. Any business activity with Russia must be completely stopped. Not a single dollar for the elimination of people. Any attempt by Russia to circumvent sanctions must also be stopped. After all, what kind of sanctions are these, if they can be circumvented thanks to simple schemes? So we, uh, we are clearly eyed about what, uh, uh, what, what is the demand from Ukraine. Um, and um, once there, there will be a de-escalation, the question is that how quickly, after, how quickly will sanctions be lifted after the de-escalation and what can be the condition of it, its immediate lift? Well, first, I think that the United States and our European partners and allies have done a pretty good job on sanctions. It could be better, but it's a pretty good job, pretty draconian. Um, I think President Zelensky is right that the principal area where sanctions have not been implied relate to oil and gas, Russian oil and gas. And so this is something where I know more work is being done to reduce European, especially gas and oil purchases from Moscow. Uh, as for the lifting of sanctions, I think it should be clear to the Kremlin that some sanctions lifts will begin um, after Moscow has stopped 
all of its shooting in Ukraine, and after Moscow started the process of withdrawing its troops from Ukraine. But such a lift should be very, very small, very partial. Um, only can you talk about major lift of sanctions after Moscow has not only left all of the, pulled out all the troops it inserted last month into Ukraine and since last month, but also has given some indication that it's willing to abide by a peace arrangement which respects Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, we know that Kremlin announced the uh, conscription, uh, the general mobilization of the Russians. So they, what they are uh, doing right now, uh, again, they are amassing uh, young men uh, that will be just tossed um, over uh, the, in, over the uh, Russia to Ukraine uh, to uh, again uh, take, uh, uh, take part in the combat actions and probably due to their not, they are not very skillful, uh, they will be mm, overthrown. And um, the question is how, uh, how does this correspond with the, with the atmosphere and the negotiation process? So um, is it a good sign for the uh, probable um, peace deal? Well, you're right that Moscow is now conscripting as they do every spring new soldiers, and those conscripts, as you mentioned, are not very well trained. <clears throat> if they come to Ukraine, um, it will be a very sad ending for them. Moscow is uh, telling the, um, the families of these new conscripts they will not be sent to Ukraine, but that doesn't mean that Moscow will not send them. Um, Ukraine obviously has to defend itself, and it's clear that the Russian leadership doesn't care about the lives of its soldiers. And of course, the Russian leadership is targeting the lives of Ukrainian civilians. Uh, this is just a fact of life. Uh, Mr. John Herbst, uh, thank you very much for being with us in our studio today and for your comprehensive view. Uh, this was the senior director of the Atlantic Councils. Eurasia Center form and former United States ambassador to Ukraine. And now we move forward uh, here with more stories for you prepared. 68% of Russian companies, small and medium sized businesses, amid sanctions against the Russian Federation uh, and the fall of the rubble, have reduced expenses on employees. So, this is the evidence uh, by the results of the uh, survey, uh, opinion poll conducted by the NAFI Research Center. Uh, and we, Russia faces probably uh, a mass unemployment uh, that is going to roll it out uh, just in a month. Uh, watching the next story, how, how quickly this will be happen. Large-scale layoffs are expected in Russia starting in April. Ural Airlines and Shermetyvo Airport have already reported significant staff cuts. The number of people who lost their jobs could reach half a million in the near future, according to estimates. The layoffs will start in April, and this will be a significant pressure on Russia from the inside. Back in 2014, the Russian financier Stepan Demurov said that TV will win in Russia as long as there is something in the fridge. According to the State Statistics Service of Russia, the unemployment rate in January was about 4.5% in the country. Officially, it did not increase significantly in March. Russian Center for Strategic Research predicts that rate may rise to 7% by the end of the year. About 2 million people could lose their jobs. However, Russian experts believe that the authorities will try to reduce the figures at the expense of employers. The Russian authorities will use any means to force especially large and medium-sized 
enterprises to maintain employment, allowing all of these forms, reduction, stoppages, vacation by agreement of parties when you are paid a little, but you remain formally employed. How long it could last and who will pay for the banquet? I still do not understand. Most likely the funding of these low wages will be squeezed out at the expense of the employee. According to a survey by the NAFI Research Center published by Ukrainska Pravda, large and medium-sized companies in Russia are already cutting costs on employees. Among the most popular measures, staff cuts, 27% of survived employers act this way, cancellation of bonuses, 26%, and quota, reduced wages. In addition, employees are being transferred to remote work, sent on leave at their own expense and transferred to other positions with changes in salaries and responsibilities. However, the layoffs will not lead to mass protests in Russia, says Anatoly Amelin, director of economic programs at the Ukrainian Institute of the Future. Many Western companies have so far only suspended operations in Russia, but the staff are not being dismissed and are being paid their salaries. Because of the drop in income and the weakening of the rubble, there is a tendency for labor migrants to leave the country. Their places will be taken by Russians, Amelin believes. There is a high level of support for the actions of the authorities. The zombie television did its job. About 75% of Russians support the current government, and most of those who dissent are the middle class, most of whom are leaving Russia now. As for the rest of the Russians, they are ready to tolerate it. People with a slave mindset are not ready to go to the barricades and take pitchforks in their hands and put the government on these pitchforks. Stoppages, absence permits and cuts in payment bonuses will certainly affect the income of ordinary Russians, Ukrainian Institute of Future states. However, people will continue to endure and save money. Reported by Roman Smoller, Anna Holot, UATV. Um, Russia is uh, relocating missile units uh, to Belarus, as I've already uh, told you before this. Um, and uh, at the same time, the general uh, staff of the armed forces of Ukraine uh, states about uh, states about more uh, more that more cities, more towns are regained by Ukrainian forces. Uh, I'm going to deliver you right now a couple uh, news um, about the uh, ongoing military campaign in Ukraine. Uh, just a few moments. Uh, Vladimir Putin, before his, uh, before the start of the military campaign in Ukraine, he uh, grossly misjudged in the uh, his calculations of his forces and the uh, capability of his army to uh, to invade Ukraine. His blitzkrieg uh, has failed, and uh, his surrounding actually uh, fails to deliver him the real situation of the, uh, of, uh, uh, the, from the battleground. Uh, this is the opinion uh, de uh, that was uh, stated by the uh, British, uh, British uh, the head of the British um, uh, surveillance, Jeremy Fleming. Uh, just right now I ask my team to, to show the, uh, to, s to show what he just said on this uh, Point. We've seen Russian soldiers, short of weapons and morale, refusing to carry out orders, sabotaging their own equipment, and even accidentally shooting down their own aircraft. And even though we believe Putin's advisers are afraid to tell him the truth, what's going on and the extent of these misjudgments must be crystal clear to the regime. Uh, now you'll see the story about the, uh, about the ongoing uh, crisis and the military campaign in Ukraine. Um, the th 30, for the 37 days, uh, Russian forces wage um, military actions and uh, continuing their crimes. So just let's see what is happening. 
Shelling, damaging and killing of civilians, the Kremlin occupiers continued to attack Severodonetsk, Lysychansk and Rubizhne. They damaged 20 objects. This includes 9 multi-story buildings, 9 private houses and infrastructure facilities. As a result of the attack in Severodonetsk, two people died and many wounded. Severodonetsk and Rubizhne in Luhansk region are left completely without water, and cities of Lysychansk and Hirske partially. 82 settlements remained without gas and 12 are off electricity. The occupiers are trying to toss all their forces into the Donetsk and Luhansk regions and fully occupy these areas. They don't need people, they don't need new, modern swimming pools, our sports fields, they don't need anything. The Russians need to check the box that they got the territory. Nothing more. Check the box. Uh, now in this studio we are joined with our next guest. Uh, this is the jo Russian journalist, uh, now the Washington-based, and uh, the member of a team of the, one of the oldest radio stations, Russian radio stations, Echo Moskvy, uh, Karina Arlova. My greetings to you, Ms. Karina. Thanks. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank thanks for coming to our cast. A uh, couple of minutes ago, we've seen a story about the how sanctions affect uh, Russian economy and um, the uh, the poss possibility. Of, my question to you is: what, What's the possibility when uh, at some point uh, the uh, the response from the Russian society will be more adequate, um, not so aggressive as it as as it's now uh, and. Uh, or somehow uh, they will turn to their own uh, leadership? Yeah, it, it will happen eventually, but not too soon, uh, I'm afraid, because um, Russian people are very resilient. And we know that even Joseph Stalin once raised a toast to the Russian people's uh, patient patience, which is really um, abnormal. Um, Russians are very resilient, but it will come, the time will come when they will have um, um, empty shelves and empty stomachs, basically. That's when they will turn to their own government. As of now, you know, um, the problems are just starting to pile. And um, we, like, because there's physically, there, there still is, you know, food and groceries and um, it, you know, the, the supply is, um, yeah, that's that's a great picture. The supply is um, somewhat adequate uh, for now. The prices have already gone um, up, which is, um, I mean, good for in terms of, you know, putting pressure on the government and on the people. But also, um, I would like to um, note that Russia is, um, is a very poor country. If we're talking about the uh, society and the standards of living, the vast majority of Russians are uh, lower middle class, lower middle class and poor people. 22 million, this is an official statistics, right? Um, 22 million uh, uh, people in Russia live below uh, the poverty line, which is, um, so Russia is 140 million people, right? So 22 of them are below poverty line. So for the vast majority of Russians, um, even a 50 percent, uh, um, you know, uh, increase in price for food is crucial. And um, the prices will go up not 50 percent. Uh, they will go up, you know, uh, two times, three times or more. It depends on, you know, the category of the groceries we're talking about. But this is crucial. Also, um, if we're talking about drugs um this is going to be a problem. It's already uh, becoming a problem and so on and so on. And people will start losing their jobs because uh, when Putin annexed Crimea, illegally annexed Crimea and uh, invaded um, Ukraine in 2015 and some sanctions were put in place by the West, um, Vladimir Putin famously started this um, program of, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the word in English is, but uh, like uh, substitute, uh, like import substitution, you know, massive program of import substitution. But it turns out that uh, what they did, in fact, is that they would stay, they produce, let's say, a, a car or something, right? Um, like a final product. They produce it in Russia, but all the components are imported 
So that will, you know, lead to that will lead to um, a pause in productions and to people losing their jobs. But it, it will happen, but not not today, not in a month, maybe. I anticipate this happen in um, maybe um, early uh, fall, uh, September, October, or something. Uh, well, w one of the experts and in, uh, in, in this studio in our one of the uh, casts uh, uh, said that uh, what actually could make uh, Russia turn to another uh, turn to another direction uh, is when uh, when their fridges will become absolutely uh, empty. Uh, and another uh, another Ukrainian expert, Dmitro Gramakov, uh, he stated that. Uh, one, another thing that can make them uh, somehow sober up is the uh, military losses. At the same time, in fact, military censorship has already uh, been introduced, and uh, in in the Russian society, um, they will they just don't see any information about it. Let let's just watch to what uh, our expert has said here. These losses cannot be concealed because people will look for their relatives. People know that they were there, members of the Russian armed forces, and understand where to find them. The more access to this information is denied, the more protest will develop, and the more protest moods will be stirred up in the Russian society. Because without access to full-fledged and truthful information, it is impossible to explain to people where their relatives have gone and how they got into Ukraine in the first place. So there will be an accumulation of questions to the Russian authorities about what to do about it further. And people will demand answers and responsible. This was, uh, you just heard, Dmitry Gromakov, a sociologist and communication expert and uh, International Center for Countering Russian Propaganda in Ukraine. Uh, and um, so this, what can make, what can make uh, Russian can make, may convince Russians to, to change their mindset? Well, I have to say that Mitra um, is talking from uh, the point of view of a, uh, you know, um, psychologically normal person and Western-oriented person, right? Because Ukraine is, uh, despite all the hardship, economic hardship it's been through, it is a very, you know, Western-oriented uh, country with that shares the same values, for instance, the value of uh, a human life, right? So Dmitro is uh, talking about um, a, a normal person, which does not apply to Russians, because Russians have a very different uh, mindset, and this is crucial. Um, this, it, it, it doesn't matter how many... Um, uh, dead bodies are, are going are going to return to Russia, and also a lot of them are just being burned, you know, um, in the front line by the Russians, of course. And the other the other um, dead bodies are just not being taken back, as President Zelensky said. So, um, you know, it's it's wrong to assume that the uh, dead dead Russians. Russian people change their minds because we have to assume that the Russians don't know what's going on. But unfortunately, the sad truth is that they do know, right? Uh, they are pretending that they don't know. But if we, uh, so there was a, a, a famous report in Deutsche Valley. It was in, in Russian. They talked to a mother of a, a soldier who died um, near Kiev in Oh. Miss Miss uh, Orlova, well, we have not very yes, good connection. Yeah, I hear you very well. Okay. Uh, just How about uh, now? just yeah, sorry. Uh, we had yeah. some troubles with connection, and we had no clear view of you uh, for a couple seconds. Also, we didn't hear the, your last uh, sentences. Yeah. So could you sorry please repeat this. it? I'll repeat. It. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm talking about an interview by a, a, the mother of a Russian soldier uh, who died um, um, around Kiev on February 24th. And um, this woman, she says, so when the journalist asks her, what, 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 what should we do now? Like, what, what, is, what, sh what, what, what approach should Russia take now? She says, we should kill them all, Ukrainians. Because, uh, you know, so despite her son 
um, despite the fact that her son died in Ukraine in this war, she wants more war. She wants more Ukrainians dead. Yeah, I know. It's just one person, right? But it is very naive to think that Russians really don't know what's going on. They do know. And you know why I'm sure they do know? It's because on February 24th, when Putin started bombing Ukraine, a lot of Russians ran to the ATMs to withdraw cash, primarily, uh, you know, foreign, a foreign currency. And that raises a question. Where did they uh, pick up this information? The propaganda channels, they don't report on, you know, economic hardship in Russia. They only report about, uh, we know what they report, um, all these fakes about uh, the war. But they, they don't tell you from, from, from the TV screens that, oh, yeah, fellow Russians, you have to go to the stores, you have to buy groceries because the prices will go up. You have to, you know, withdraw cash. You, you need to buy foreign currency. No. So Russians do know somehow that they need to undertake certain steps to protect themselves financially. And it means that they seek this information somewhere and it is impossible to not know, to not, you know, see, to not know what's going on if they know what's going on in the economic, uh, in the economy. So it is, unfortunately, it is the sad truth. The Russians know they don't care about what's going on in Ukraine in terms of, you know, Ukrainians dying and stuff. Unfortunately, I'm very, it's, it's, it's a very sad fact, but it is true. What made them so uh, uh, uninterested in what's happening in Ukraine? And, and this is it just a Putin's uh, Putin's uh, affection or impact of his policies over these uh, last decades, uh, or this is something more rooted? I think it's certainly something uh, more rooted, right? Because both Ukraine and Russia come from the same country, the Soviet Union, right? And uh, we all share the same um, um, uh, psychopath Stalin who murdered people. But um, uh, to me, it was also very interesting, always very interesting, how Stalin hated Ukrainians like, more than anybody else, probably. And he tried to just, you know, to starve them. Uh, and probably the reason to that is that Ukrainians are just different people. Uh, you know, they're just different people with different mindset. I'm, you know, I think a lot of doctorates and PhDs can be <laughs> written uh, on this topic um, of why Russians are so numb. You know, they're psychologically and emotionally numb. They don't have <clears throat> sympathy and they just, it's, 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 a, it's a very strange effect, but it is what it is, because I remember very clearly in 2015, when some dead bodies of soldiers were coming back to Russia from Donbas. And uh, I was working on Dorst, the TV channel Dorst, and um, Dorst uh, did a good reporting on it. So they went to see these um, unnamed um, uh, graves that the foreign ministry, you know, <clears throat> where they put the dead bodies. And they tried to interview the families, and the families would just deny any interviews. And um, But we, we, we knew for a fact that they were paid uh, by the uh, defense ministry, paid for, you know, for their loss and for their silence. So they chose to take these, I don't know, $20,000 or whatever they, they got. Instead of being properly, uh, instead of... Uh, being paid properly as a compensation, they were uh, they were paid in turn for their silence. Right. So because there is no law that you know tells you that um, you you have to you must be. Um, sorry, Miss Karina. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> My connection. Yeah, is is not great. Sorry. So, uh, Miss Karina, uh, we uh, we just uh, uh, we just want to say thank you, and let's briefly uh, give some summary of what is happening uh, right now and what can uh, bring Russians back to normalcy. <laughs> what is your stand? I don't know. 
I don't, I don't know. I want to say that's a good question. So I, I, I personally, I, I love President Zelensky. I really liked him from the beginning when he was running for president, right? Because to me, he always seemed like a, a very just kind person, you know, and Russia has never had just a, simply a kind person, like a, a you know, a well uh, mean person. Um, so, sorry. Um, sorry. Can Some... you hear me? Problems? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, so um, I, I even think that if somehow President Zelensky uh, becomes Russia's president tomorrow, I don't think it's going to change anything because he's not going to be popular because his kindness is not going to resonate with with the Russians with a small portion of Russians. Yes, of course, like those I don't know five percent or ten percent. Yes. Who? Cool. But the, the the majority no. They need this cold blooded. These, you know, dead eye, uh, cage beast, um, these um, very evil men like Putin, right? And that's a very good question. What what can change Russia? Probably nothing. Probably, you know, there is nothing that can change it. And that's why I think that Russia should be defeated by the entire world. Otherwise, it's going to pose um, a, a danger to to everyone in the world, not just, you know, military danger to Ukraine or some NATO can countries. Karina, um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for your answer. And um, I don't know, it's all, also a very good answer. And after that, you've, ga uh, you, you've said many beautiful words, not only about the president. This is, uh, for, for me, it's an incredible uh, even to think about it. If uh, once Zelensky would become the president of Russia, uh, at least we should try. Uh, thank you very much for being with us here in our studio. This was uh, Ms. Karina Arlova, journalist of the radio station Echo Moskvy. And now let's go, uh, let's move forward with our next stories prepared for you. Uh, this one in particular is about canned thermo accumulators, a special uh, startup for the military. The production of devices uh, for melting paraffin was launched in Lviv, uh, western Ukrainian city, the invention of a Mykolaiv resident, Alexander Lipatnikov, was improved by his 16-year-old son. Um, our correspondents found out what they look like and what they, why they are so useful by Ukrainian military. This is special equipment for melting paraffin. It works like a water bath. The water is heated and the paraffin melts. Usually this temperature is up to 100 degrees. In this small room, five volunteers work every day. Here they assemble canned thermo accumulators. First the paraffin is melted, then the jars are prepared. Cardboard is inserted into each so that the flame lasts longer. The hot paraffin is poured over the cardboard like this. It helps to burn longer. Later it cools and we roll it up. You know, this cardboard replaces the usual wick. Previously the decorative candles were produced here, but it was not difficult to retrain. It wasn't difficult for us to change our line of work we are for such initiatives. Where we can be helpful, we try to help. The idea of canned thermal accumulator belongs to Alexander Lipatnikov and his 16-year-old son. The family arrived in Lviv from Mykolaiv when shelling started there. Thermal accumulators have been made since 2014, but now they have improved their invention. It is multifunctional. Ukrainian soldier can take this container of paraffin and melt the paraffin with a potbelly stove or put it into boiling water for 10 minutes. The paraffin melts in temperature of 60 degrees and accumulates a large amount of heat during melting. After that he can put it in his bosom and receive heat for 4 hours, or can open it and get heat for an hour or use it to warm something. In order to produce such thermal accumulators, three tons of paraffin was provided to volunteers for free by one of the factories in Bohuslav. Cans were delivered from a warehouse in Zaporizhia. Students of the Ukrainian Catholic University gathered money for a special SEMA. The equipment was bought in Poland. This special SEMA equipment we bought in Poland. It works very easily. With it we can make about 200 cans. Two 
date, several thousand camp thermal accumulators have been sent to the front line of the Ukrainian military. Reported by Olena Shustova, Julia Bil, Lviv, Ukraine, UATV News. Back to studio and uh, right now with our next guest. Uh, he is uh, an agent of Ukraine before the International Court of Justice, permanent representative of the President of Ukraine in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, Mr. Anton Koronevich. My greetings to you. Uh, greetings. Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming with us. Um, we want to talk with you about recent uh, situations on the uh, just in the negotiation processes and in the, um, our jurisdictional uh, sphere. So uh, we, we all uh, know that what is now happening uh, today. Mikhailo Podolyak has, has uh, announced the next stage of negotiation process in uh, online format between Russian and uh, Ukrainian delegations. Uh, what is the type of document they are uh, trying to uh, reach out? First of all, I, was, I will start with your question concerning uh, the uh, international courts, just to mention that actually our case on uh, allegations um, of genocide um, against the Russian Federation is now moving forward. Uh, we uh, have an order uh, of the International Court of Justice dated 23rd uh, of March, and in that order the court gave Ukraine time till uh, the 23rd of September 2022 to submit our memorial and uh, we will do our best in order to fulfill this assignment, this task uh, as soon as possible. So we are working closely with ICJ on this case about which we talked with you uh, in, in March. Concerning the negotiations, uh, of course, they are very important and uh, it is very important that uh, if they may bring, uh, first of all, peace and uh, if they may bring the uh, guarantees of uh, security of Ukraine and uh, if uh, they can lead us to the ceasefire and uh, to, to stop this horrible war. So um, I really hope that uh, rather soon this whole process uh, will end and uh, the war uh, will be finished. Mm, exactly. The, the topic we were discussing a uh, couple weeks ago was uh, our efforts, uh, overall efforts, how to bring Russia to justice and what uh, you are doing as the member of uh, Ukraine's delegation and agent uh, to the International Court of Justice is just incredible. And th at the same time, we, we understand that this is not the only ground where the uh, juris uh, jurisdictional judicial decision can be done. So this is why I'm mm, questioning. Right now Ukraine is trying to create a new, uh, a, a new framework. It's a big document, a new deal that uh, at the same time can be different also in uh, uh, judicial aspects. And you as, a, um, as probably a man who works in this sphere can somehow comment on this effort. Uh, just the, an, another question is: Should should the peace deal also incorporate uh, Ukrainians' uh, our, our uh, demands to Russia uh, of uh, how to bring them, um, how to deem them uh, accountable for all happening? Uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact uh, what uh, will be included in this treaty. Uh, which will be the clause, the uh, regulations concerning this issue of um, judicial uh, fight of Ukraine against Russian Federation in international courts and tribunals, yes, how we call, it, how we call it lawfare. Um, our cases in international um, judicial bodies in uh, uh, ICJ, uh, International Court of Justice, in European Court of Human Rights, in International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the situation on deliberation uh, in the International Criminal Court. So all these processes are, are going on and all these processes are important uh, directly for the issue of bringing uh, Russia to responsibility in different international courts. 
but nevertheless, it does not make any harm to uh, negotiations now. And uh, you see that negotiations move uh, rather quickly and rather effectively. So I do think that uh, we can we can still fight and we can still use international courts um, uh, even uh, when we are now, I hope so, on the brink of some agreement with Russia uh, in order to stop the war. Uh, another question is, um, well, um, if it's possible to, to somehow uh, say right now about it, how many, uh, how many documents have been submitted by Ukraine against Russia in this, over this uh, month? And uh, what they, uh, for example, in the latest speech, Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, stated about the ports. And uh, do we submit uh, in more cases uh, in each single uh, issue that uh, rises? Well, uh, we submit all the documents, all the issues which might secure our position in the International Court of Justice. Um, we launched the um, whole package of documents together with the application with the respect for indication of provisional measures on the 26th of February. Then you, of course, know that the court was sitting in The Hague on the 7th of March. And on the 16th of March, the court uh, issued an order uh, on uh, imposition of uh, uh, provisional measures. Uh, the same goes, I'm sure, um, in, in uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Uh, the same goes in the International Criminal Court, which now I think and I hope has enough information in order to move forward with uh, investigation uh, of uh, the alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity committed uh, in the territory of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, by Russian Federation military personnel and uh, political uh, leadership. Uh, of course, we will uh, submit more documents in particular, as I said, uh, we have a deadline of 23rd September this year, 23rd September 2022, uh, in which we are to file our memorial. But of course, we will try to do our best to file the memorial as soon as it will be possible. So the things are going on, the documents are being prepared. Now the, um, also the colleagues from other ministries are very active in particular uh, when we talk about European Court of Human Rights, as we all know that Russia is no longer a member to the Council of Europe since 16th of March this year, and that the Russian Federation made official notice that it will uh, withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights so the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg will be effective for Russia bef uh, before the deadline of 16th of September 2022. So our, our government has some uh, si six months in order to file as many things to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, as, as it can. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of governmental agencies of Ukraine are now active uh, on this track of lawfare of uh, legal battle against the Russian Federation. And of course, um, all these governmental agencies will submit new documents uh, in order to secure uh, our position. So from, from what you said, I just, uh, I, I, I get very clearly that the September uh, is just the, uh, the threshold when uh, something, uh, some, uh, some already initiated cases uh, will be, started to uh, view in a, in, a, in a court. Am I right? Uh, well, not really. Um, I'm, 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 I was saying that uh, we are to file memorial in September. So, and the memorial is actually a document uh, with all the Ukraine, with all the facts and all the issues of our position. But as I said, we will try to be faster and uh, if we be faster, it would be good. Uh, uh, September is like a deadline for European Court of Human Rights. Uh, in Strasbourg, as, as I mentioned, uh, the European Court of Human Rights will cease to work with Russia on the 16th of uh, February 2022, uh, 16th of September, sorry, 2022. So uh, for ECHR, for European Court of Human Rights, really this uh, half of a year, these several months, are very important uh, because afterwards uh, there will not be a possibility to sue Russia in this court. But in, in any other, including the International Court of Justice, of course, we will 
we will work on uh, in order to bring Russia to uh, international legal uh, responsibility. Uh, so very quickly, uh, just one question or a couple questions. Uh, how the issue of Crimea uh, is uh, pointed out in uh, this process? Or it's not, it somehow works in another cases? No, no, Crimea is everywhere. So because, uh, of course, we are all aware that the Russian aggression against Ukraine started in February 2014 with uh, occupation of Crimea and with attempted annexation of Crimea. So really, in all the cases in ICJ, in uh, International uh, Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, um, in uh, European Court of Human Rights, of course, Crimea is uh, one of the main instances and uh, one of the main stories Uh, which goes uh, in this court. Uh, the same goes uh, in relation to International Criminal Court, which now um, the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court considers that there may have been war crimes and um, or crimes against humanity allegedly committed on the territory of our Crimean Peninsula by the representatives of Russian occupation authorities since um, February uh, 2014, when the Russian Federation started to uh, exercise effective control over Crimea. So, of course, Crimea is in every Ukrainian legal position, in every um, international court or tribunal or arbitration. Uh, that's good news. Uh, and we, I, I hope that we'll, we'll cherish all, all together the hope that Once the, uh, there will be once a day when uh, when we'll see the all Russian crimes persecuted, uh, and thank you very much for this work and your personal efforts, also and for being with us in this studio, uh, Mr. Anton Koronevich. This was an agent of Ukraine before the International Court of Justice and permanent representative of the President of Ukraine in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. Uh, also. Uh, we move forward and I want to present you our next story uh, about the, uh, the, the very common problem that is happening right now in Ukraine. Uh, the uh, internally displaced people from uh, many war-torn uh, towns and cities and particularly this one is about a person who uh, came to other city of Ukrainian city from Mariupol. Uh, let's, let's see Watch the story. I love my native, the city of Mary. The life of Aleftina Shretsova more than a month ago had been divided into before and after. Joy and love for her hometown were replaced by exhaustion, pain and tears. Yes, looking at the photos, I don't recognize my native Mariupol. You know, it's terrible when people come to your land, they destroy our beautiful city, they bring with them the idea of war and destruction. The morning of February 24th for Aleftina, as for millions of Ukrainians, began with terrible news about the beginning of the war. The girl was born, grew up and lived in Mariupol. She worked as a journalist and created an author's project dedicated to her native city. Like thousands of Mariupol residents, she did not leave the city immediately. And when she came to her parents' house to celebrate the 12th birthday of her brother, she found herself blocked inside the house for a terrible 13 days. We thought that we knew what we was because the 2015 events demonstrated to Mariupol residents that Russians would not stop before the lives of civilians. We were ready for it, but no. When we moved to the center where nine people had already resided to the moment, we were just about to face the worst thing, the air raids. Since March the 1st, there were no electricity, water, communications and then heating in the city. Only a week later, Aleftina managed to return home to her eight years old son and husband. But the situation in the city worsened every hour. There are funnels in the ground about four meters deep and more than seven meters in diameter. We got the information about the destruction of such objects as the maternity hospital. Another bomb flew from an airplane not far from our house, and it became more and more dangerous every day. In order to get at least some news, despite the shelling and air raids, they had to get to that part of the city where mobile communications sometimes operated. Every day the girl waited for news about the Green Corridor. However,
March 16th was the last day for the decision. It was then that a bomb hit our entrance, the place where we cooked food on a fire. Our neighbors were killed. In addition, a huge stone fell from the ceiling in the shelter. We realized that even this place would not save us. Then we took a decision to leave Mariupol afoot because we didn't have a car. Together with her husband, son and his parents, for a whole day the girl was getting out of the completely destroyed city. They reached the village of Portovske. They found a car there and decided to return to take her parents and younger brother. Fortunately, they succeeded. Now the family is safe, but nothing can take the mind off the scenes happening in their native city. I believe that soon Mariupol will be free, our beloved beautiful Mariupol. It has always been, is and remains a Ukrainian city. That's why I don't plan to go abroad. I sincerely believe in the victory of our Ukrainian army. I really miss my hometown. Reported by Yulia Hranovska, Pavos Telmach for UATV News. No less than 200 civilian lives. This is a very narrow uh, calculation of uh, how many people have died uh, over the uh, occupation of the small town uh, north to Kiev called Irpin. Uh, this figure was uh, uh, announced by the town's mayor, Alexander Markushin. Uh, but these calculations are not final. The exact number of victims will be known only after the rubble will, is cleared. Let's watch next what Irpin looks like after the Russian liberation, so-called. Irpin is just 20 kilometers away from Kiev. The town was chart-topping among the Kiev inhabitants. Young families bought apartments here. The city grew by leaps and bounds, and it was distinguished by contemporary high-rise buildings. However, now it is unrecognizable. The first battles began in Irpin on February 27th. The city was under constant shelling, both from the ground and from the air. We see that 50% of the city and its critical infrastructure is severely destroyed, and we have not sorted through these rubbles yet. And there are people here for sure. Many have left, of course, but many have stayed. The first evacuation of the civilians took place only on the 5th of March, but it proceeded under constant fire from the Russian invaders. Today we are evacuating people from the Synergy. I am glad that everyone is alive and well. I don't worry, our troops are strong, we will win. Today, Irpin is under the control of the Ukrainian military. They run a clean-up operation. The territory is shelled from the surrounding occupied cities of Bucha, Gostomel and Warsaw. According to the mayor's estimates, there are still about 3,500 inhabitants in the city. Up to 50 Ukrainian soldiers and territorial defense fighters died during the battles in Irpin. The mayor spoke about the atrocities committed by the invaders in the city. Russians crushed the bodies of our dead Ukrainians, civilians, using tanks. They simply rolled them into the asphalt. We certainly will not forgive any Russian soldier for this. It was scary to look at, although I had already seen a lot. But... The city is destroyed not only from the outside. The so-called liberators did not shun anything. The so-called Russian world was everywhere in here. Doors broken, they rested here. Bastards. They probably wanted to steal the washing machine, but it was too heavy for them. Reported by Marina Stepanenko, Anna Hollard, UATV News. And nothing can be done at the moment with it. Ukraine must win. These simple words will be on the cover of the next issue of the Economist newspaper. Now we see it on screen right now, uh, where you'll see that uh, the major image on the cover is uh, the face of uh, the Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky. And uh, quite simple words, why Ukraine must win. As the war enters the sixth week, uh, the side that is contemplating victory in this war, despite all wishes of Vladimir Putin to made uh, to make uh, the uh, invasion uh, successful just in three days but this is ukraine that is winning right now and this is all for from us for this time for today tomorrow we will meet again and we'll meet again with in our new broadcasts uh, this was uh, u8 english broadcast and nick starkov i'll see you tomorrow